Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Genial Jack, Volumes 1 and 2. Uh, these are part of an ongoing world building project being done by Jonathan Newell over on his blog, Bearded Devil. Uh, Bearded Devil is one of my favorite blogs. His world is incredibly fantastic and super detailed. His map making is especially excellent. Uh, he has a number of these fantasy cities that he's developing in tremendous detail, including Hex, which is a wizard city. Um, Gossamer, which is a fairy city, and this one, Genial Jack, which is a city built inside of a giant god whale, composed of all of the wreckages of the ships that he has swallowed, and the civilization that has been built by all of these stranded mariners. So we have two volumes so far. This one is a basic rundown of the setting as a whole, and this is a, as a dungeon crawl through the insides of the whale itself. The back covers right here. So we have a, he is a whale, a whale the size of a mountain and the maze itself, a living maze of darkness and fear and ancient wonders. Before we start, though, shout out to today's sponsor, which is The Waking of Willoughby Hall, an adventure that I wrote and published just recently. Uh, so you can explore a manor full of a rampaging giant, restless dead, and a very angry goose. You can meet new people, you can discover new wonders, solve mysteries, and try and get out alive. I'll put a link down in the description below for where you can pick this up for yourself if you want to check it out. Also, of course, a shout out to some of our new patrons. Shout outs will be at the end of this video for all of our new patrons. Let's look at what we get in volume one right here as a general overview of the setting. Now, this whole book is designed uh, for fifth edition D&D specifically, but like most D&D stuff, it's pretty easy to translate it to um, old school D&D, mostly because 5e has more stats than you really need, and it's not that hard to just boil things down and simplify them. All of the art in here is also done by Jonathan Newell, and it's published by Lost Pages. So issue one of Genial Jack provides an overview of the inhabitants and districts of Jackburg. That's the name of the city on Genial Jack. While written with a larger campaign setting in mind, Jack can easily be dropped into other fantasy campaign settings, particularly those in a wild, high magic, or gonzo aesthetic. Indeed, Jack and his symbiotic city could form the basis for an entire campaign as the God Whale travels from port to port. Subsequent issues will provide additional NPCs, campaign locations, and adventures. We start off with looking at the people, the different races that you can find uh, most predominant inside Genial Jack, including these uh, undead Draugr, the Finn folk who are quite sinister and have a reputation as being kidnappers and criminals, the Fomorians, giants from the land of fairy. For us humans, we have jelly folk uh, who have a unique form of social organization known as a bloom consisting of a group of jelly folk that have a psychic link. The Karkanoi, a little bit like a giant crab men. The Octopoids. Really, the, the flavor that I'm getting from a lot of Jonathan Newell's stuff reminds me of Bass Lag, which is a the fantasy world that we find in Perdido Street Station, which is a really interesting fantasy novel. Um, the focus on weird cities, on very strange creatures, and even this maritime setting reminds me of The Scar, which is another book set in Bass Lag. I really like that setting, so this is very exciting to me. We have the polypoids. Uh, polypoids, yes, that's how you say it, uh, which are based off of coral reefs. We have rat folk, because of course you have rats escaping a seeking ship. The Silatians, Silatians who are these giant shark-headed um, brutes. Great if you want some muscle. We have sirens, undines, urchins. Urchins are funny because they act like street urchins in the city, but they're also literally sea urchins. Um, and uh, they live short lives and they're always begging for food. But if they've made friends with you, then after they die, their whole society cooks and eats them. It's just part of their culture. And they will hand out some of the delicious, delicious urchin meat to anyone who is a friend of the uh, unfortunate. We have a giant, o giant overview of Jackburg here with the different districts. So we have the Coral Fortress, the grooves, which are on his um, inside or right on his chin, I suppose. Melon Ward, the Blowhole Row, the Dorsal District, the Roost, Barnacle Bank, and the Fluke Fort. This is Outer Jackburg. There was also a very detailed interior Jackburg as well. Uh, it appears that Genial Jack doesn't really mind having large cities built on him. 
Each of these, starting with Barnacle Bank here, has a number of encounters, usually between one and three, uh, that give you some real flavor for what you're going to discover if you go and visit there, along with some more detailed locations. These are, um, although there's some good detail in here, there's probably not enough to run this uh, each of these districts extensively, because you're going to run through two encounters pretty quickly. Um, but if you're just traveling around the city in a pretty quick manner, going from location to location, you're going to have a lot of fun stuff to throw in there. But you're probably going to have to start making up some of your own if you want to have a longer campaign. The Coral Fortress, the Dorsal District, is the center of food production for Jackberg. So, for example, we might have things like Loose Magical Beasts as an encounter, or a Whale Guard Dispute. We have a number of different factions that are at war here. And I see there's a little bit of a printing error here where it kind of faded out. We have the Fluke Fort. The ancient castle of Fluke Fort is now largely abandoned, the fortress having fallen into disrepair. So there's now spirits stock the halls. I suppose you could use this as a miniature dungeon that you could explore, um, but it doesn't really have a lot of details for it. So you'd have to flesh that out yourself. Although there are some fun encounters, as you would expect. We have some grooves that are usually underwater on the chin of Genial Jack. And these are all going to be watertight and are usually occupied by creatures that live underwater or can breathe water. All the way up on his head, we have areas of um, this exterior city that um, these priests live in. And the ones that are right above his head, where the floor is actually the skin of Genial Jack, these priests have learned to psychically communicate with him. Um, by standing or sitting on the floor and, and uh, meditating, which allows them to possibly communicate and guide the direction of the city. Although he is a god whale, so you're only going to have so much influence, probably. Inner Jack Berg. So once you actually get swallowed, uh, that's to Ma Town, that would be in his actual mouth, we get into the four stomach, which is Flotsamville and the coils, the main stomach, Bellyboro, Queen's Corner, the Bor Borgimus Bazaar, the Gut Gardens, the Drog Twist, Beozar Crook, uh, Connecting Chambers is all this area. The Pyloric Stomach, which Finn Fulkheim, and the Duodenal Ampula, which is Ambergris End. Ma Town is the area out in front, so if you ever swim directly into Genial Jack's mouth, you're going to get exposed to Ma Town directly. The bizarre mansions of Ma Town dangle from chains suspended from the roofs of Genial Jack's massive mouth, glittering like lanterns against the darkness of his gullet. Accessible only via private elevators lowered from the foyers of these luxurious palaces, the mansions are partially sheltered from water by Jack's huge baleen. But like the outer town, they are built to be watertight, sealed against flooding. Lots of great images that you can really riff off of while running these types of uh, adventures or running a setting like this. We have the esophageal tram, so a train line running down his esophagus. You might wonder, how does Genial Jack continue to eat with all of this stuff cluttering his mouth and his stomach? Well, the people who live here are highly invested in Genial Jack staying alive. So there is an entire uh, ecosystem or a whole industry based around making sure that Genial Jack gets fed and huge amounts of fish are poured into his stomach for him to absorb. Uh, the, the smells inside Genial Jack are described as being incredibly overwhelming, although most of the people there are used to it. You're inside a giant stomach and it's going to be full of, you know, rotting fish and so on, but it has its civilization of its own. So we have the coils, named after the skeletal remains of a giant sea serpent that Jack swallowed many centuries ago, now reclaimed by Jackbird's inhabitants and transformed into the city's pleasure district. We have Flotsamville, Bellyboro, which is great. I love these illustrations. They seem a little cluttered at first, but then you look closer and you find that there's tons of these little details where you see that there's these wrecks of all of these ships. So we have Queen's Corner up here, for example, which is made up of four large ships that all had the name Queen in them. Queen's Corner, right? So we have uh, Queen's Queen Raphaela's Vengeance, the Queen of Carnage, the Tenebris Queen, and the Queen of Lost Souls. These four ships, respectively, have been repurposed as a courthouse, a grand hotel, a theater, and an auction house and art gallery. Drog Twist, where a lot of the undead Draugr live. 
Finfolkim, where the Finfolk live, Ambergris End. So now we're right at the entrance of where we'd be transitioning into the intestines, which is where our next book is going to come in. Ambergris is mentioned quite a lot throughout these books um, because Ambergris is an incredibly expensive uh, resource that you're going to want to mine and collect as you travel through Genial Jack. It's a real substance, actually, that you would find in uh, real whaling cultures, where it can be turned into things like uh, perfumes and uh, has other uses as, as well, I believe. We have some on the world building here. So the government and the authorities, the captain's conclave. We have some of the factions, the navigators, the whale guard, which is the navy and the police force. I love how we have illustrations of some of the submersibles that you can acquire. Some laws on uh, just some of the laws of Jackberg in general. So dueling, dueling is completely legal and encouraged. If you hire a lawyer, half the time you're not just hiring a lawyer, you're hiring a professional duelist who can duel on your behalf. We have some of the uh, ways that the unique structure of Genial Jack is worked out logically. So there's population control in place because you can't have overpopulation when everything is so crammed shut. Um, if you have too many kids, they may ask you to be getting off at the next port. Stowing away is also a no-go. However, if you were in a ship that gets swallowed by the giant whale, then you are automatically an honorary citizen. So that's a great way to get your players on board. Some different crime gangs. And we have 20 Jackburgers. This is really great, because if you're having players just wander around through these different districts, you're going to want to be able to throw them uh, NPCs left and right. And here's a whole bunch of them. And we have a giant rundown of all of the uh, locations right here. So you can see it all on one page. I like that as a poster. That's really cool looking. Uh, and let's look at our second book now. So this was just the setting, but now we get into an actual adventure. This is dungeon crawling through the intestines, which sounds really gross because it is. The book really leans into that. We have the play testers here. So here's a number of the different characters that have in the past uh, gone exploring through Genial Jack. A whole bunch of uh, adventure hooks, reasons you might, why you might want to be going into this uh, very gross dungeon. So, for example, uh, during a raid, Gut Reavers kidnapped a dozen Jackburgers, and the Whale Guard have thus far been unable to recover them. They're hiring mercenaries to travel to Herniaheim to free the enslaved citizens. Entrail shopping, so some of the equipment you're going to want to bring. There's a lot of explosive and flammable gas running around inside those intestines, so you're not going to want to be bringing uh, torches or anything with open flames. Throwing fireballs can also be a serious problem. What you're going to want are light sources that don't have flames. So we have an anglerfish lantern or a jellyfish lantern instead. Fume hounds to detect fumes. We can bring gas masks or even very expensive diving suits. The gut gardeners. Uh, which is a kind of class or NPC that for uses a form of druidic magic blended with ancient technoscience dredged from the ruinous libraries of Jack Berg's past to keep Genial Jack's digestive microbiome as healthy as possible. So they're sort of uh, plague doctors in a sense. They get things like acid arrow, protection from poison, stinking cloud, gaseous form, but they also have a miasma that they can produce that is uh, not great for people around them. They can speak to animalcules, which is basically uh, microbiomes, so uh, the cells or the amoebas. And they can have rapid healing at a high enough level. We have some intestinal perils you might run into, things like, of course, the fire hazard, the miasmas, navigation, because these intestines don't stay in the same place. Once you go back, they've all shifted around, and so you're going to have a really hard time finding out where you're going. Compasses are also going to be fairly useless because Genial Jack is going to be traveling and moving in different directions. So the actual orientation of the dungeon is going to be shifting all the time. The stench. The stench within the entrails is so vile it can be debilitating. So look out for that. Gas masks might be required. A whole bunch of random encounters. Let's see, 20 of them, including something like, for example... Mm, what's a good one here? Tapeworms. Something slithers ahead. Long, segmented shapes, pallid and drubbing. They flicker, oddly graceful, until they move to attack, mouth parts glistening. 1d6 adult tape tapeworms attack the party. We do have uh, actual stats for our monsters at the end of the book. We have some weird lost artifacts you can uncover here. In the eyes of the octopus idol, Jack's blood, the necklace of decapitation. You put it around someone's neck and it slowly tightens until it decapitates them, unless they find a way to cut it off. 
The rude shield. This shield bears a grotesque face upon it, leering and hideous, with bulbous eyes and off protruding tongue. The face is intelligent and highly observant, and utters incredibly insulting commentary on anyone who sees it. So here we get into our first map, which is the small intestines. We start out up here, and the, notice how the intestines are not uh, linear. They branch and they twist and they reconnect, uh, making this quite a maze to explore. Uh, I suppose a good party would actually start leaving markings behind them to figure out where they've gone, and so that way they can figure out how the branches uh, weave and connect to one another. It goes all the way out to here, where it will continue on to an even further dungeon. Each of these locations is marked with a number right here, and it's great that we have a number of different senses that are lit listed for each location. So we have a sound, for example, at the very beginning, steady dripping, the churn of machines deeper in the guts, a distant miner's pick, the slosh of water. We also have a smell, of course, but the smells are not going to be the same throughout the whole place. Uh, almost beyond description, a mixture of sewage, dead fish, and festering garbage, and then sights, what you're going to see there. Sometimes this will include people as well, uh, breaking it down by senses is really great because it really allows you to immerse the players more into the setting. However, there are some locations where the sites in particular are quite extensive and we do end up getting these large blocks of text where sometimes we get um, bolded text for the different characters, but the rest of it is just, is just one, one big block. And that can be very hard to run, especially if you're running this quickly, because um, reading a lot of this is going to be a pain. It's going to slow the game down. And you're really going to want to be able to pull out the important material um, at first. But what do the players see immediately? Uh, what things do they not see unless they investigate? It can take a little while to pull that apart if you're just going through this, um, just reading off the fly. So I would have liked to see more structure put into that. Some primeval octopoid ruins, all sorts of things have been swallowed by Genial Jack, including the ruins and uh, ships. So you can find things from all sorts of lost civilizations down here. It's a great excuse to have a very gonzo dungeon. The wreck of the Fengbao. Egg clutches, some slaughtered gut reavers, and a whole outlaw camp is down there. Perhaps you can ally with them, but more likely they're going to try and rob you if you look like you would be easy prey. A fragment of Yes. So this is a fragment of bygone Yes. A sunken city from distant legend is lodged in the organic walls. A stone structure, impossibly old, carved by ancient hands with runes now indecipherable. There we go. To all but a handful of obscure sages. There's a portal here that can take you to a number of weird locations, including the Dreamlands, Carcosa, Fairy, or the Netherworld. Then we get into Herniaheim. So our last uh, dungeon links up to right here. So there's a whole city here that's right before we get to the large intestine. And this is a linear city all done in a row. And we can see that each of the different sections here are numbered with like 21, then 21A, 21B, and so on. And there's a ton of detail here. So as players travel around, you're going to be able to describe to them exactly what they see in terms of what the buildings look like, uh, where the bridges are, and so on. I really like that. I think it cuts down a little bit on the description when the pictures are good enough that you can just describe right off of them. This is definitely a much more dangerous and more outlaw-ish city than the parts of the uh, whale that we've seen previously. We have a lot of detail for each of these locations. And as I mentioned before, uh, some of these are quite uh, a chunk of text, which I would have liked to see broken up, perhaps with some bullet points, uh, some bolding, uh, any way to make the reading it a little bit easier to run on the fly. Uh, we get into the large intestine here, similar to the small intestine. Uh, it does branch and split and twist around. Uh, things get, I, in general, more and more dangerous the deeper that you go. Narwhal skeletons, a swallowed sh a sea devil shrine, uh, the swallowed sea devil herself, amoeboid infestations, the lair of the true vampire squid, the Fecalith Watchtower, that's pretty gross. Uh, Goblin Celestian Village. You can find buried treasure down there. Elder Ruins. The Nest and the Monolith. All sorts of weird uh, metamorphoses that you may undergo if you mess around with this monolith. Because you don't want to mess around with ancient monoliths deep inside the guts of a whale. What are you doing? And we start getting into a bestiary, a bestiary at the back of this book. 
along with stats. This is, as I mentioned, fifth edition, and uh, some of the write-ups are pretty extensive, uh, really more than I would necessarily need, uh, although cutting them down is usually not that big of a deal. Uh, some of these are quite long. I believe that there's one of the... Um, the True Vampire Squid, for example, has basically a monster description that is two pages long, which is really more than I need. Um, but if you're running all of 5th edition's mechanics, it does have information for those. And uh, Zombie Thrush spawns at the very end there. So that's what we get for Genial Jack Volumes 1 and 2. Uh, there is a ton of information in this, and especially when we're talking about uh, these gut dungeons that you can explore. If your players aren't too squeamish about some pretty gross material, it could be a lot of fun to throw them into, uh, and especially if you have anything involving a maritime setting. Before I go, quick shout out to some of our new patrons over on Patreon, including Mike Burke, David King, Snoblin, Lassie Borley, Ben M., Sigvi Solvag, Rage, Aaron Goldbeck, uh, Chad Robb, Matthew Morris, and Orstier Studios. Thank you so much for supporting the channel, guys. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.